talking about walking in the light. First John chapter number one as we continue our series in the book of First John, a great book, lots of different themes in the book of First John. He talks about loving the love of God and loving the world and not loving the world. He'll talk about having security in our salvation, end of, the, end of the book. He'll talk about having love for one another in the book of First John. And he'll talk about um, the lust of the world and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. He'll talk about things um, about our salvation, about the gospel in the book of First John. He talks about joy, as we looked at last Sunday night, and about the joy that God promises to bring when we have fellowship with him. He says that your joy will be full if we have fellowship with God. I don't know about you, but I want to be a joyful Christian. I remember before I was married, there'd be people that talked about getting married. I'll just wait till you're married. One time, Mr. Swain used to be on staff. He was on staff for many, many years. He was a principal here at the school before. And when he left, I took over that, that spot. And uh, he did a session for family emphasis uh, on, I think it was, How to Keep Zing in Your Marriage, I think was the title of that session. All right, it was years ago. After that session, he came to me, and he and Sharon uh, and Doreen and I would often go out for double dates. They were probably, what, 30, probably 30 years older than we were, but we had a great time with them. We'd go and have a good time, and, and uh, he talked about some things in that session. Well, afterwards, someone came up to us. We were dating at the time here at the church, and they said to us, well, just wait until 10 years into your marriage. Now, what's that supposed to mean? I, th I think it was a, a testimony of what their relationship looked like with their husband and wife, what I think it looked like. And you, you see people like this, oh, we have to go back to church. Now, what's that supposed to mean? What's that supposed to mean? Does that mean the church is horrible? This is the worst thing that can happen on a Sunday is going to church? I happen to think it's about the best thing that can happen on a Sunday, going to church and spending time with other Christians in God's house, with God's people, and ultimately with God himself. And John says, if, if we have fellowship with God, your joy, your joy will and should be full. So if you've got a sour face and you've got a rotten life, it's not God's fault. It's a fellowship fault. Your fault. My fault. Let's be honest. There are those days, weeks, can we be honest, when things seem dry. When the well seems to be scraping the bottom as the, the well of, of eternal water that we're trying to drink. And John addresses this, and last week we looked about, about how to walk in the light, that, that God is light, it's foundational. If you would look with me, please, in verse 5 of 1 John chapter 1, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Lord, I thank you for your word tonight, for this passage. Lord, I ask you to give me the wisdom and direction that I need as we look at this passage from, from John. Lord, I pray you'd help us to be listeners that would honor you and your word. Lord, you've promised that your word and stated that your word would not return void. Lord, I ask tonight that your word would accomplish everything that you wish it to accomplish. Lord, while you do not make us follow you, you implore us to. Lord, you're such a good God. Lord, may we look to you and turn to you, and, and there's ways that we're not pleasing you, Lord, that we confess them and get right and go after you again. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. In 1686, 1686, there was a man that may be familiar to some of you. As soon as I say his name, he'll be familiar to almost all of you. His name was John Newton. He had these three laws, Newton laws. The third law states this, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. We find that to be fairly true in life. Actually, it's a law, so they say it's always true, but I find it fairly true. That means this, if I have a, a two liter of Diet Coke, and if I take an action of putting a Mentos inside that two liter of Diet Coke, there will be an opposite reaction, and that Diet Coke will shoot up to the sky. Newton's third law clearly in action. 
But I see this third law clearly shown in this passage as well. You see, because we don't just have the light in this passage. We looked at that last week, how, how it's foundational, that God is light, not just a light, he, or the light, he is light, the essence of light, that's God himself. But you can't help but read these six verses and not notice another concept, and that is the concept of darkness. You see, we're supposed to walk in the light, and we're supposed to, because of that, we will, because of that, reject the darkness. I want to look at tonight the rejection of the darkness. You see, moderate Christianity says this, you can have your cake and eat it too. It says it doesn't matter what you do or how you live, God wants you to be happy. God wants you to be thrilled with life. And God does want you to have your joy full, but he tells you how to get it. Moderate Christianity, modern Christianity often will say this, uh, that whatever you do is fine as long as you just follow God. This passage defeats that concept. This is not a list of do's and don'ts, but the fact that Christ lives you and you follow him. This passage sets up a positive and a negative, and there's a positive and negative in the very fiber of creation. There is light and there is darkness. There is good and there is evil. There is a place that God is, and there are places, there's a place that God isn't. Are we clear on that? As we live our life, there is a place that God is. It's the light. But because of that, there's places, there's a place that God isn't. And as Christians, we ought to seek to be where God is at. That's walking in the light. We walk in the light as he is in the light, we'll fellowship one with another. But because we walk in the light, we will inherently reject darkness. I want to look at this rejection of darkness tonight. I will give an illustration toward the end of the message. For the sake of illustration tonight, we're going to call the stage to be light and the steps and everything down there to be darkness. So tonight you are in darkness. If it was later on in the season, I would have the lights turned off, but because of the sunlight coming from the outside, it will make no difference on God's green earth, and so we will not do that. But you are in darkness tonight, all right, just for the sake of the illustration, not in reality. And we're, we're going to look at that and look at the illustration a little bit later on as we want to reject the darkness. John makes a few statements. The first thing he says is verse number six. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Now, sometimes people will say this about this passage. They'll say, listen, you'll know you're saved if you never do anything wrong. If you do one thing wrong, you're not saved. Well, that can't be true, can it? Are you perfect? Am I perfect? Not yet. My wife's shaking her head. Not so hard, honey. Please, not so hard. It really hurts my heart. I can still see you from right here. Even though it's darkness down there, I can still see you. Well, this passage cannot mean that if I make one mistake, I'm not saved. You see, I mentioned this last week. There is this concept that this fellowship is just salvation. That these words in here in First John are just salvation. I don't buy into that. I don't believe that at all. The, the scripture does not interpret that way. This is not just about salvation. This is about a relationship with God and whether my relationship with God is good and right or whether it's in trouble. And you can do things, I can do things to walk in darkness that'll make that relationship to have, some little bit, to have a little bit of trouble. Just like you can have a little bit of trouble in a marriage relationship. All right, in a marriage, I can walk in the light or I can walk in darkness. Walking in darkness, I could flirt with other women. That would cause this relationship to have a little bit of conflict. A lot of conflict. Mucho conflict. That's much conflict, Puerto Rican. I can have light and darkness in a friendship, though, could I not? Or could I not have conflict with a friend because I, I make choices that would hurt that friendship? For sure. And John illustrates the same thing. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. This is not talking about perpetual or, or sinning, it's it, not talking about um, occasional sinning, it's talking about habitual sinning. But I want to talk about the three excuses that we use as we walk in darkness. Verse number six, I'm going to use a big word here, but I think you'll, you'll understand it as I explain it. The word is this, it's antinomianum. It means to reject the law. 
What that means is that there's a group of people, and we see this in 2019, that say, look at me, and here's the quote, I'm obviously walking in the light. Look at me, I'm walking in the light. Though they are clearly not walking in the light. If we, if we say that we walk in the light and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. All right, listen, you can't tell me this is not the light. I believe it to be the light. I, it is the light. I read about this. There was, a, there was a pastor on a Sunday morning, and he preached a terrible message about just why everything he did that we would say would be darkness was right, and God loves all of it. Talk about terrible things. We know that there are some things that God rejects, right? There are some places that God is and some places he isn't. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But we know that. You know, there are churches now, I'm talking about Baptist churches, and uh, recently, on, uh, back on Mother's Day, the pastor had his wife preach the message on Mother's Day. Now, I'm going to write an article coming up here about why Doreen will not be the co-pastor at First Baptist Church. Now, you laugh, but I'm not jesting, all right? I'm writing the article because this is, this is coming down this path, all right? And I'm talk not talking about the progressive church. I'm talking about Baptist churches who have gone to good colleges not the college's fault, it's their own choices. My wife's not going to help me pastor this church. There's a big old church, and other denominations have done this for years. All right, big old church have done this for years. And there's one that I read about recently. Husband and wife um, co pastored the church. They were, they were both preaching at the church, and they got into a nasty divorce. Problem was, the church liked her preaching more than his preaching. That's why I don't want Doreen to preach nothing about the Bible. You'd like her more than me. But when you say, hey, why is your wife preaching on Mother's Day? The Bible teaches this. I'm walking in the light. That's not darkness. That's the light. They reject the law. I've talked about that, that church in, in uh, Florida, Orlando, that's a microbrewery. Right? The church brews the beer, and then they drink after church. Right? I, don't, I don't know how you can read your Bible and think that'd be a good idea to have that at church. Okay? But if you were to address it, I believe I know what they would say. I'm walking in the light. If we say that we walk in the light and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. There's a concept out there right now that says, listen, you can't tell me that I'm in darkness. I'm not in darkness. I'm obviously walking in the light. The music that I have in my church, it's obviously where God is at, even though it is straight out of an ungodly singer. I told you this before, but I went to a church once, visited it just once, and for the offertory, a girl got up and sang, we are the champions. Right, honey? I'm not telling you. She's wearing a tight pair of white jeans, singing that song, dancing all over the stage. That's not light. I'm sorry. I'm, you shouldn't like that song. But even if you say, it's a good song, it's not a good song. It's not a It's not a... That's not the light. That's what he's saying. There are going to be Christians, talking about Christians, who are going to say, yeah, look at me. I'm in the light. No, you're not. You're in darkness. Yes. You're walking in the darkness. If we say that we walk in the light and walk in darkness, we're a liar. There are places that God is and places that he isn't. This idea out there is called the hyper-grace movement. In the hyper-grace movement, then there's nothing that should be stated about what we should or shouldn't do as a Christian. Everything is acceptable because of God's grace. God wants to give you a grace hug today, and if, if, you, if you want that, you take that. And one person told me once that the, the, the Holy Spirit led them to stay home on a Wednesday night, and the time they had with God was just, I think they said almost better than going to church, something like that. Now, listen, you can stay home on a Wednesday night. Right, you shouldn't, but you can. But don't blame God. All right, that's not walking in the light. That's walking in the darkness. There's a difference. All right, and that's what John is saying, first of all, that there's a difference. And if you, if you want to reject the law, all right, or reject these things and walk in darkness, you're, you're just going to be a liar. Read this, there's a popular pastor. No longer a pastor now, not a Baptist church, a big church. Many people followed him. I believe he had the largest church in the state of Michigan for a while. 
He said this, that he had nothing but ridicule for the gospel that Jesus died for man's sins. He's a pastor of probably the largest church at that time in Michigan. He said, what happens when a 15-year-old atheist dies? Was there a three-year window that he could have made a decision to change his destiny? Did he miss his chance? What exactly would have had to happen to that three-year window to change his future? He says, some believe that he would have had to say a prayer. Now, Christians don't agree on what this prayer is, but for many, the essential idea is that the only way to heaven is to pray at some point in your life asking God to forgive you and telling God you accept Jesus, you believe Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for your sins, and you want to go to heaven when you die. I agree with that. I think you have to pray, believe in your heart, confess in your mouth, all right? I'd be one of those people. He said some call this, quote, accepting Christ. Yeah, I call it that, amen? <laughs> what the Bible says. Um, others call it getting saved and being born again. Maybe you ought to read John chapter 3 with Nicodemus or being converted. He ridicules the repent and believe gospel. He says this, how do you make sure you'll be a part of the new thing God is going to do? How do you become, how do you best become the kind of person whom God could entrust with significant responsibility in the age to come? The answer is, well, God will show you how to live and live that way. The more you become a person of peace and justice and worship and generosity, the more you actively participate now in order and working and bring about God's kind of world, the more you will be ready to assume a greater role in the age to come. Denies the gospel. Denies accepting Christ as our Savior. This is a pastor of probably the largest church at that point in the state of Michigan, five, six, or probably seven years ago now. A man that, that uh, some of my contemporaries read his books that he wrote. And you read that, that's not the light. That's not the light. God is light. In him is no darkness at all. Now, there's another excuse that's made in verse number 8. If you look there with me, please. He says this, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. See, at first we claim that we walk in the light and reject the kind of rules, perhaps. But here is a, a de defined an inherent goodness. I don't, if I can say it this way, I don't feel like I'm walking in darkness. I don't, I don't have sin. I, I, don't, I don't feel that it's a problem. I, I, we, we have no sin. I, I don't feel that way. I, I inherently, I, I make good choices. Inherently, I will feel what is right and wrong. And inherently, I'm going to fall on the right side of things. And it brings, what happens, it brings a very feeling-based walk. We got Christians that live a life of feeling. Uh, Pastor, you talked about music at church. I just, I just don't feel that what I listen to is wrong. And I don't feel that way. Really. What does wrong music feel like? Because wrong music feels to me like my flesh likes it. Just saying. Uh, Pastor, you know, you talked about, about reacting a certain way to your spouse. I don't feel that I could do that. Really. You don't feel that way. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't realize that was a, an option on the table. He's saying, if we say we have no sin, I don't feel like this is sin, I don't feel like that is sin. I feel like I'm, I'm inherently, I'm a pretty good person, and inherently, I'm, I'm going to probably fall on the right side of things in life. The problem is, there's a place that God is, and there's a place that He isn't, and it's not based upon my feelings. I can't live my life just on what I feel. You see, we feel things that aren't right. It says if we do this, we deceive ourselves. I have a man up camp this last three or four days. Great time up there. Another shameless plug for it. Men, if you haven't had a chance to get up there to man up camp, make a point to get up there. Some of the best food you'll have all year long. No offense, ladies, all right, but it's good food up there. Pastor Scott does a phenomenal job. Told you this morning, but the first night, hamburgers and hot dogs. Second night, uh, we had steak and shrimp. And the last night, tacos, Korean beef, 
beef brisket and Thai chicken. All right, delicious food up there and a great breakfast. But shameless plug for Man Up Camp. We're in the tent a couple nights and I'm in my, been with my boys. Listen, dads, you got a couple sons or one son or two sons, three sons, I don't care how many sons you got. It's great to spend time with your boys. We're up there at Man Up Camp and, and um, in the middle of the night, my son James wakes up. Wake up and I, and I see him standing up in the tent. All right, sorry, James, I'm going to, you know, that's what happens when you're a pastor's kid, you get stories told about you. You'll deal with it. He said, James, what are you doing? I don't know, it's three in the morning. And he mumbles some response back to me. I realize he's asleep. He said, James, lay down on your pillow. Now, he's at the, the edge of the tent right by the door, and his cot goes this way, and his pillow's about right here. Well, he plops himself on the end of his cot, just like laying on the cot. Pillow's way over there. He's laying down, curled up. I said, James, lay on your pillow. And he looks at me, that half-glazed stupor that most of us men have in general, all right? <laughs> Crawls a little bit further, maybe three feet, two, two feet. Boom, lays his head back down. His pillow's still a foot and a half away from his head. I said, James, lay on your pillow. Finally, he crawls back and boom, slaps on his pillow, sleeps the rest of the night just fine. He said, Pastor, how are we going with that? Well, he felt like he was on his pillow in his half-dazed, sleepy state. If I said, James, are you on your pillow? Eh, I would have got the eh, response. All right? Which loosely translated means, yes, I guess. I don't know what it means. And my son Johnny woke up in the middle of the night, too. He did. He yelled for someone to help him, another boy. He said, Nathan, Nathan, help me. I said, Johnny, go back to sleep. Boom, falls back to sleep. <laughs> but I hear that sleep talking doesn't just happen to boys, it happens to adults too. Isn't that right, Pastor Dylan? <laughs> just asking for confirmation. There was no point to that question. Am I allowed to tell that, Miss Kaylee? I am. Apparently, uh, last night, he, he was talking to sleep as well. He said, make sure we sing happy birthday to Andy Ash, right? <laughs> she asked me in Sunday school, is this Andy Ash's birthday? I said, no, I'm sure it's not Andy Ash's birthday. And she said something like, are we going to sing? Or, Will you sing with me? Yes. And he says, yes. He goes, back, back to sleep. <laughs> Feeling. Not nearly as bad. Pastor Fusco's coming to preach for us in a few weeks. Now, yeah, I shouldn't tell you this story, but I'm already started, so I might as well tell you where it's at now. We're on the senior trip, and on the senior trip, and uh, he was next to me in a hotel, and I was reading my Bible. He had fallen asleep. He goes, hey, baby. I did the only thing a man could do. I grabbed my phone, I put it on video. <laughs> I'm gonna make some money off this right here. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a little bit of blackmail sometimes. He slept the rest of the night, I didn't sleep at all the rest of the night, he slept the rest of the night like a baby. We've got people as Christians, half asleep as a Christian. Based on what they feel, I feel like I'm in the light. Ah! You're not in the light. You're in darkness. What does the scripture say? If we say that, we only deceive ourselves. We're the only one tricked. Everyone else can see what's going on. Those stories are kind of humorous because there's one person that's awake and one that's asleep. I could observe what was happening. Miss Gailey could observe what was happening with her husband. And what he's saying is, listen, if you're not in the light, you're going to look like a fool in his eyes. Inherent goodness. There's one more defined here in verse number 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Well, the first verse we said that I'm walking in the light and clearly I'm not. I, second one, I don't feel like I'm walking in the light and this one I'd phrase this way, me? I've never walked in darkness. Who, me? 
No, 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 pastor, you must be talking about someone else, and we do this at church as well. The pastor's preaching, and we've had some great Tuesday night messages, have we not? And Pastor Fong's on prayer this past Tuesday night, man, it was powerful. Pastor Let's on Joe, Brother Davison's on um, the correction, man, just some great messages. But we sit in those messages, and we think about other people who need that truth. I hope they're listening. Boy, this is good for them. Hope my kids are listening. Hope my wife is listening. Hope my husband's listening. Hope them across the auditorium is listening. Who? Me? I don't walk in darkness. No, no, no. No, no. Not me. Perfectionism. Who? Me? I, I have judged myself to be righteous. I have now become the righteous judge in my life, and I have deemed that what I do is right. Not just that I feel, but I'm saying, who, me? I do not walk in darkness. Maybe you don't know who I am. Maybe you don't know what I do. Maybe you don't know where I've been. But me, I don't walk that way. See, the first step, I'm a liar. The second step, I'm a fool. But this one, we say, God's a liar. The verse says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him, who's him, God, a liar. <laughs> Can I tell you something? He's not. He's not a liar. You see, because, because of the light, I must reject the darkness. You say, well, where's the darkness, Pastor Howell? And there are times that you get up here and you can tell what the darkness is. He can give you some things that are darkness and You'd say amen to some, and you'd be convicted about the others, and you disagree strongly on the other ones. But if you would, hold your finger here and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to finish up in 1 John, but turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, it says, With fornication and all uncleanness and all, or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saint, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Verse number six. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things come with the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Here's look at verse number eight. Here's the key. For ye were sometimes, help me, what's the next word? Darkness. See that word Darkness. But now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Amen. You see that connection? He says, walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is all in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. What he says is there are some things that are darkness. And you used to be darkness, but once you're saved, you're children of the light, so walk as children of light. Not the light, but walk as children of the essence, light itself. Because God is light, in Him is no darkness at all. It says, for the fruit of the Spirit is goodness, righteousness, and truth. Goodness is uprightness. Righteousness, virtue, and acts of virtue. Truth related to God. And verse number 10, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. How do I walk in the light? I prove what is acceptable unto him. I don't go based off what I feel. I don't go based off what I know. We learned this morning that my mind is bent in a fallen, sinful direction. I go based on what is acceptable unto the Lord. How does that happen? I follow him in a relationship. I seek his face. I pray and say, God, I need your wisdom. I need your spirit to guide me, help me to walk in the light and to reject the darkness. Could happen. I get up here and say, listen, if you walk in the light, you'll never listen to this kind of music. Many of you would say amen. Problem is, all you'll be doing is rejecting darkness, not walking in the light. But when you walk in the light, as he is in the light, you'll have fellowship one with another. If you begin to walk in the light and seek God's face and prove what is acceptable in the sight of the Lord, we will be in about the same place. I was talking with someone recently about a particular issue from the Bible. I made this statement that we have become 
scholars of scholars, not scholars of Scripture. What I, what I mean by that is that we have become to just follow what someone says rather than follow what the Scripture says. Rather than find out what it says, we just spout what we think about it or what we heard someone say, and we don't know what the Scripture says, and we don't know why we do what we do. We need to be students of the Scripture, scholars of Scripture, so we can walk in the light. Look back to 1 John, please. We have to reject the darkness. But there's this verse snuck in the middle there, verse number 9. It says if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This, I believe, is a key that unlocks this particular passage. This is a key when we put this key in the hole and turn this key, we now see the the entire passage, I believe, making sense. John begins and says, listen, listen to me about Jesus Christ. I'm a credible witness. I touched him. I heard him. I saw him. You can listen to me. If you follow Christ, you'll have fellowship with him like we have, not like we had, even though he was gone. He said, like we have. And if you have that, you'll have joy. Once you have that joy with that fellowship, you'll walk in the light, not in the darkness. You'll walk in the light as he is in the light. And you'll reject the darkness, but, but, When you slip, look at verse number 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is not talking about salvation. Okay, well, say, how do you know that, Pastor Howell? Well, this is clear. No one was ever saved by confession of sins. Right? Right? That's not the gospel. If people were saved by confessing of sins, then every Catholic would be saved because they confess their sins. But we're not saved by confession of sins. That's why this passage is not about salvation. It's about a relationship. You see, it's written to Christians. It restores fellowship. He says, forgive us our sins, removes the damage from sin. Jesus said this in the, in the prayer when he trained us how to pray. Forgive us our sins, trespasses, or debts, depending on the passage you look at, as we forgive our debtors, trespassers. Removes the damage from sin. Every time we walk in the darkness, we are damaged by sin. We're dirty. And also removes the defilement of sin. He promises to cleanse us. So that we can then boldly approach the throne of grace so that relationship can be restored and our joy can return. Litmus test, fellowship with God, defined by walking the light. Not just a claim to walk, but it can be a reality. Christian, walking in the light can be a reality. There can be joy in your walk. And when you mess up, well, you can have restoration. I brought... Told you about illustration I have. Pastor Ryan, you're right there. But I'm not going to use you. I need Spencer. Sorry, Spencer. You you drew all the short stick tonight. It's red. Go ahead. I need this to blindfold you, okay? Okay. So just tell me when you can't see any longer. I can still see. Okay. You want me to pull it tighter? No, it's not tight. Okay, move it so you can't see, then I'll pull it as tight as I can. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That? All right, how's that? Uh, close your eyes. Big nose goes, so. Okay, close your eyes. All right, there you go. Spin you a little bit, you're fine. Okay, all right. Now remember, okay, that this is light, right? And this is darkness. Problem is, we're supposed to walk where? In the light. Just come over here, give me a hand. All right, you're fine, just keep on walking, just trust me. I don't, I don't know. Okay, come over here, take a step. Oh, no, take a little step up. Take a step. Take a, okay, turn this way. There we go. All right, eh, come about right. Okay, now don't move. You're at the edge of the stage, just so you know. You hear Mark? Mark, say hello. hello. Remember? Okay, he's right there. That goes straight down, just so you know. Yeah, I wouldn't. I like would. a leap of faith thing. No, sir, no, sir, no, sir. You see him well over there? Now, we're supposed to walk in light. I wouldn't even fall forward, actually. That'd be bad. I'd feel bad. We're supposed to walk in the light, right? 
The problem is there's a lot of Christians who ignore the help we have, which is called the Scripture, to walk in line of the Holy Spirit, who will guide you into all truth. And so I can be over here, I'm in the light, and I say, Spencer, just come to me. You say, well, that could be a fun game the rest of the night. You're absolutely right. That's right. Because the other thing you forget is we have adversaries who are trying to push us into the darkness. Right? Now, Spencer... I called Pastor Ryan up on the stage. Oh, no. He's about an arm's length away from you. <laughs> and on the count of three, I'm going to move over here. I want you to run to me. I'm going to have him try to push you down the steps. I'm going to see who's going to win here. My guess is he ends up in darkness. What do you think? All right, you ready, Spencer, to run? And don't go down the steps. It's about seven steps down. Ready? One. Two, I'm not going to make him run. <laughs> you sit down. You can sit down. Thanks, buddy. Oh, you, you're, you got your phone just to see what I'd do with that. Thanks. You guys can be seated. Thanks, buddy. Here's the point I want to make. We're walking around blindfolded. We're supposed to be walking in the light. We wonder why our life stinks. We wonder why we end up in the darkness. Why? Because we're blindfolded. Walk in the light. We have an adversary out there. He's trying to knock us down in that, in that darkness every single day of our life. Every moment of the day, he's trying to knock us down in that darkness. And there is no way we can stumble through the light. Can't do it. We can follow the light. We can walk to the light. We can live in the light. But it will not happen by accident. Won't, won't happen. I'm safe, Pastor Howell. Wonderful. Are you walking the light? You're rejecting the darkness? What happened by accident? What happened because of that fellowship. Lord, I thank you for your word. For the light that you can give to us. Lord, we need you. Lord, I want to have that joy every day in my life. Lord, I want this wonderful church to have that joy every day of their life. Well, we got to follow you in the light. One who would say, Pastor Howell, as you spoke, God spoke to me today, tonight. There's an area and areas that I maybe haphazardly were claiming to walk in the light, but I'm walking in darkness. I don't have that joy that you claim that John says we can have. It's a relationship problem. Pastor Howell, would you pray for me because I need to restore that fellowship with God. Remember 1 John 1, 9. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He would say, Pastor John, would you pray for me tonight? I need that. Would you pray for me? Amen. 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 I want to reject the darkness. Lord, you've seen these hands. Lord, we want to be children of the light, as Paul says in Ephesians. Lord, would you guide this time of invitation in Jesus' name? Amen.